Hi there, I'm your host, John Iverson. I'm joined this week by my National Post colleagues, Terry Glavin and Sabrina Mado. Welcome, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our common bond beyond the post is that we were all declared persona non grata by the Russian Federation last week. Three of 61 Canadians who were sanctioned for poking Putin's criminal regime. And as far as I can determine, all that means is that we will never be able to visit Russia. But uh, I don't know whether either of you think that we should be a little bit more nervous than that, wary of drinking tea with Russian visitors. Sabrina? Uh, no, I'm not too nervous. And like you said, I don't have any plans to visit Moscow or anywhere else in Russia anytime soon. So for me, not losing any sleep over it right now. Terry, have you read the fine print? I, I saw the translation. It did talk about uh, further actions, and it wasn't clear to me whether it was further actions against us or further actions against other people. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's kind of sad, you know, like, I don't know, I don't think I'll ever be able to go back to China. I don't know no, that I'll ever be able to go to Turkey there. again. Uh, and I won't be able to go back to Russia. And I actually find that quite upsetting. I mean, it is amusing, right? You want to, you want to yep. have a laugh about it. But I, I'm kind of upset about that. I know the Russian Far East a little bit. I've never been to Moscow. I've been to bits of Siberia and Habarovsk and uh, Irkutsk. And the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, there was such a thing. Where? Uh, way the heck and gone out in the, uh, the you know, the Heliangjiang River is the border between China and Russia. Yeah. It's on the, Hel on the Russian side of the Heliangjiang. And um, uh, also Ulanude, Buryatia, nobody knows about, nobody's ever heard of Buryatia. It's curious, I was there actually, uh, the very first piece that I ever filed to the Ottawa citizen was uh, about the about the rise of it was springtime of the oligarchs about 15 years ago and the the obliteration of all of the small nations east of the Urals and right. uh, here we are uh, you know and uh, the Kremlin is, is attempting to do just that in the most wicked and violent way with Ukraine so I I do think you're, I take your point on China. I mean, I, I uh, never think I'll go, I don't think I'll ever go back to Hong Kong, which is tragic. Yeah, that's a real sad tragic. Story. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with that. Um, Hong Kong was one of my favorite cities. I've been multiple times, and yeah. unfortunately, I would not feel comfortable going back anytime in the foreseeable future. So yeah. I think it is a shame that um, as journalists, uh, we're, we're able to travel less and less freely. I think that's going to be in common with a lot more people, though. I mean, one of the consequences of this and whatever follows in, in the Far East in Taiwan is that our globe is shrinking for many of us. I mean, we, That's we, right. we, we, uh, we think about the, the world as a village, but uh, it's, it's splitting into separate spheres and, and never the twain. We should never cross them. Can I turn to um, the conflict? Um, in recent days, I've been quite surprised by President Biden's boldness. It's, and it's not a, a word you would normally associate with Biden, I don't think. But, you know, initially the Americans re reacted quite cautiously. Uh, they blocked the transfer of fighter jets from, from Poland to Ukraine. Uh, but since the fighting has moved to the east, they seem to have been emboldened. Concerns about escalation appear to have been erased in Washington. Biden's now pushing a $33 billion package of aid to uh, to support Ukraine. What do you make of this? Uh, is, is Biden calling Putin's bluff. What do you think, Terry? Well, I think that there's been a lot of, uh, the, you know, we talk about how NATO is unified and, you know, Trudeau goes, brings all of these, these cabinet ministers to Europe and does the kind of, you know, ABBA world reunion tour two or three weeks ago. And, uh, and uh, th this, this business about a united front, I don't think there really has been, I don't think it has been that united. When you look at the way Poland talks, the way the Baltic states talk, the way the Czechs talk, that's not the way the French or the Germans talk. And you remember a couple of weeks ago when Biden said something like, we got to get, or that guy's got to go. And then there was a big flurry over the weekend where the State Department and the White House were issuing, uh, you know, uh, cautions and denials and no, we're not interested in regime change and all that sort of thing. Um, I don't think there's actually been a clear understanding in Washington about what the end game is or was or should be. 
Uh, and uh, when you, I, I recall the uh, the Biden's State of the Union address a few weeks ago, where he talked about uh, you know how to do, you know how Putin is going to pay in the long run, and over time he will uh, he will you know be made to sort of amortize his debt to the to the Ukrainian people and the the rest of the world. Um, what what's happening now may be a kind of a coalescence of different views in the intelligence community in the states, the State Department, and the White House, and the Pentagon uh, about what they're really up against. So, um, I mean, it's 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 kind of late in the day, but I, I guess it's better than nothing. Right, Sabrina. I mean, to Terry's point. Uh, Lloyd Austin was in, uh, went to Kiev, the Defence Secretary, US Defence Secretary, and talked about our goal now being to weaken Russia's ability to, to wage war. And I think that that was probably looked on a little bit askance in, uh, in some European capitals and probably in Ottawa too. It, it did sound like uh, it wasn't quite just the defence of Ukraine. Do you think that, uh, that the goal posts have, have shifted a little bit? and that they, the alliance is going to be weakened as a result. I do think there is a recognition that Russia, especially under Putin, will be an ongoing threat. This will not be a one-time thing, even if Ukraine manages to stay independent. So I think we're seeing that shift in U.S. policy. Um, as Terry said, though, a lot of it is just so, so late. This should have been done a long time ago at the beginning of the invasion, if not before. And one of the measures you mentioned, there was a large aid package for Ukraine from the U.S., but something else significant they announced yesterday is they're going to um, be able to seize assets uh, more easily, and they're also going to look to be able to sell those and put the proceeds back into Ukraine aid. And the other thing that's really big is that so far, all the sanctions have targeted oligarchs and their families, but they now actually want to be able to make it illegal to have any of the proceeds or profits of these kleptocrats, of these kleptocrats uh, which means they're targeting enablers. That can be lawyers, finance professionals, real estate agents, anyone who is still working with these people, and that is key to uh, really striking the financial heart of the matter. So, Terry, while we're seeing the American line hardening, we're also seeing Putin's line hardening, and he's been talking about uh, veiled threats about nuclear weapons, and, and obviously the, the Russians have cut off natural gas supplies to uh, Poland and to Bulgaria. How do you see this playing out? Do you think there are uh, there is a possibility that it could escalate even to the point of nuclear weapons being used? Well, there is always the threat of the Russians doing something really, really awful. Um, one of the things that I don't know that anybody noticed it, I wrote a small piece about it last weekend when uh, Russia's ambassador to Canada, Oleg, uh, Oleg Stepanov, uh, had communicated to both uh, Justin Trudeau and the foreign minister Melanie Jolie that uh, the, the Russian intelligence was uh, indicating that either the, it depends which sort of general you know you were listening to, that either the Americans or the Ukrainians were about to engage in some horrible false flag weapons of mass destruction event. Uh, and I mean, this is crazy. Um, the, the guy that, that, that t shouts the loudest about this sort of thing is Igor Kir uh, Kirillov. Uh, he's the chief of the Russian Radiation Chemical and Biological Protection Force. He's been talking about this kind of stuff for ages. He's accused the Americans of sending um, wasps infected with African swine flu out of its uh, out of a public health research lab in Moldo Moldova. Anyway, um, they, they, the Russians are keeping that kind of conversation going because they know it terrifies people. And this has been a, a real frustration for, for President Zelensky. Um, because every time he says, could you close the skies, please? Could you help us close the skies? It doesn't matter that ever since March 3rd, uh, he's basically said, I'm giving up on a NATO no-fly zone. Whenever he says, you have to help us close the skies, the, the next thing you know, everybody's 
wetting their pants about, oh, he's asking for a NATO no-fly zone, which will mean an inevitable conf uh, confrontation between an American F-35 and, an, and a Russian MiG-19, and uh, that will inevitably cause Putin to go crazy, and he's going to reach for the red button, and it'll be nuclear holocaust. I really think we need to calm down about that, and we have to understand a little bit about deter how deterrence works. But there are still any number of tools in the toolkit, if you like, that we've yet to use. Sabrina mentioned the, uh, um, the initiative that has been proposed to not only freeze Russian assets, but to seize those assets and redistribute those assets to the victims uh, of Russian aggression in Ukraine. And that's actually quite possible as it is. Something like half of Russia's foreign reserves, uh, it's within the capacity of the G7 countries to seize those reserves uh, and uh, redistribute them, to take them away from Russia. Um, about a year or so ago, there was an initiative. People like Alan Rock and Lloyd Axworthy and Peter McKay, Michael Ignatiev, were trying to establish, they had this idea of establishing in Canada something that looked a little bit like the International Criminal Court, that would work a little bit like Magnitsky sanctions, but would do just that. That these oligarchs and kleptocrats would have their uh, assets seized, not just frozen, and uh, redistributed to the victims of uh, their criminal behavior. So I think there's a lot that we could be doing now. Uh, there's still a lot that we could be doing, you know, s sanctioning Vladimir, Vladimir Putin's girlfriend, whatever. Um, you know, the we really do have to face up to the fact that, and I hope the penny drops soon, that this is a lot more serious than people think. And uh, we can't allow uh, Putin to, to, you know, or we can't allow ourselves to think, well, you know, uh, it's not a, Ukraine's not a NATO country, so we can't risk nuclear war. Um, well, what if, he, what if he invaded a NATO country? The, the argument would be the same. We can't yeah. risk nuclear war. Biden's line of, of late has been that uh, caving into aggression would, would be more costly than, yeah. than the $33 billion that he's putting forward. And that's a kind of an echo of JFK's famous line from the Cuban Missile Crisis, that uh, the greatest danger of all would be to do nothing. Yeah. So, so, while I agree with you, Terry, that the the, the nuclear uh, argument has been sort of overplayed from the Russian side, that they're that they're, um, it seems to be something they believe works to divide the West. I think it does work to divide the, the West. I'm, I'm told that the the, the NATO allies are, are now sitting down talking about what they would do in the event that a tactical nuclear weapon was dropped, and clearly the. Uh, the, the Germans and, and, and other European countries that might be in the front lines of that are, are very nervous about it. But so are the Canadians, and I just wonder what you think about Canada's performance. Have we, uh, I, I think it would be too much to say we've covered ourselves in glory, but have we uh, at least done the decent thing as, as allies? Sabrina? I think we've done as much can, as can be expected of us militarily. Of course, it's no secret Canada's not a great military power. We're never going to be, you know, on the scale of what the U.S. can do or even other European giants can do um, in terms of helping in military aid. Um, where I think we could go further, though, is in the financial sector, uh, where when it comes to sanctions, and not just sanctions, but actually enforcing sanctions. Canada has a terrible track record of sanctions enforcement. Um, since 1992, we've only charged two people with evasion, evading sanctions, and only one of those actually went to trial. Um, so if there's no punishment to go with the sanction, it's like a parent counting to 10, but nothing happens when you get to 10. They just keep counting. So there are loopholes in our own system that we need to address if we really want to be a partner um, in the way we should be to Ukraine and other nations that are dealing with aggression and uh, human rights crises. Uh, 
Additionally, uh, we also have a huge corruption problem in Canada, and whether it's Russian oligarchs or whether it's kleptocrats from other nations, uh, this is an ongoing problem. It's been known for a long time, and it's something we have to deal with, or we're going to keep enabling and empowering um, these, back, these bad actors around the world. What do you think, Terry? That was, uh, that was a lot of what was on everybody's mind a, a year ago when Axworthy and Rock and McKay and Ignatia were proposing the Inter International Corruption Court. And I think really what the motivation there was, was my gosh, Canada really needs to go deep to do something about its reputation, as you describe. And this, this idea was, 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 uh, was I think, to, as, as, to address that as much as anything else. Okay, we're running very short on time, but I do want to mention a, case, a story that Terry, you, you wrote about, which uh, I didn't know anything about, and I think it deserves a wider audience. Uh, the curious case of Halid Barakat. Can you just give us the, quickly the gist of what, uh, what happened there? Well, this actually does play into, uh, or it spins off what uh, Sabrina was saying about people coming in and out of this country as though we don't have an immigration department and nobody's really paying any attention. Khaled Barakat is, according to the Israeli intelligence agencies, um, Shin Bet, Mossad, uh, and so on, um, a member of the, the Central Committee of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And he has been in and out of Vancouver, mostly Vancouver. He spent a few years in Germany uh, since about 2003. Uh, he is intimately associated with what the Israelis call a proxy organization as well of the PFLP called Samadun. And um, that organization last February was listed specifically in its own right as a terrorist organization, a function of the PFLP, but an independent listing of Samadun as a terrorist organization. And three days later, Samadun was given a formal recognition as a federal non, not-for-profit corporation in Canada. Um, and uh, the Israelis and Jewish advocacy organizations have been very quiet about this. It came to me in January, and I've been sort of trying to figure it out and dealing with it off the side of my desk. There's a lot of really difficult and sensitive stuff to confirm here. Um, but yeah, at the moment, uh, Barakat is fighting a, uh, an order by the German courts uh, disallowing him from en entry into Germany for four years. Samadun's partner organization in France uh, just last month was, uh, was dissolved by an order of uh, the President Macron. Um, the, the, you know, it's, it's a, there's, I think there's really something wrong with uh, citizenship and immigration, public safety, all of these issues about dirty money entering the country, sketchy individuals coming in, in and out of the country, you know, the, it's just, it just seems to be broken. And uh, the, the Afghan experience speaks of that. The difficulties that Ukrainians are having, filling out forms, trying to get to Canada. There's something really broken at the senior yeah. levels. There. For sure. I, so, I mean, you got a guy who's banned in Germany, organization banned in France, identified with a terrorist organization that advocates resistance by any means necessary, alter ego organization is legally registered as a not-for-profit, operates with complete impunity in Canada. Am I missing anything? I mean, Sabrina, last word to you. What do you think that says about, what does it say about Canada in terms of blind eye to such behavior? Yeah, it should be a shocking story, but for anyone who follows this sort of story, it's really not. Um, unfortunately, it's closer to a regular occurrence in Canada. First, we became a haven for money laundering and then for transnational cartels, uh, specifically the fentanyl trade. And that's gone also into terrorist financing. They're all related. And it comes down to the fact that we don't know who's coming into the country. We don't know who's here and we don't know who owns what in the country, um, which has resulted in major problems. And often these aren't even people who are, you know, deep undercover or hiding their identities. They are wanted by other nations around the world or they're banned from other nations around the world. So the question is, why can we not do the same? Great stuff. Well, listen, guys, thanks very much for that stimulating discussion. Hope to have you back. Thank you. Nice seeing you guys.